good day student. Uh, my name is T.A. Popi. I'm a civil engineering lecturer. Today we are going to look at plant and equipment level two, topic number four, which is the hand tools. The, the outcomes that we're going to, to cover, it's only two outcomes. Uh, you must be able to know how to use the hand tools and you must also know their function and be able to know how to identify them. And lastly, you must be able to know how to cluster them according to the trade that they belong to. In your, your workshop, just take note that the workshop is a, a working place where you must keep it clean all the time. And each and every tool after you use it, you must be able to go and pack it away in a designed place so that it doesn't injure anybody or it doesn't get damaged itself. And you must need to work around the place which is not clean. You must always make sure that your surface or your area that you're going to work on is clean and neat. So don't follow the, 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 simple, the sample that you can be able to see there on the slide. People might be surprised, what is it that we're talking about when we talk about the hand tools? There is three classification of the tools. So the first one, you, you, you must be able to know exactly whether if you are going to use it for the specific reason or for the specific task, then there are plenty of the tools that you can have. But when you have those tools, each and every tool when it was manufactured, it was manufactured based on the trade that is going to be classified under. If you are a carpenter, for an example, you will need tools that only a carpenter will need. But if you are a tiler, what do you do with the tools that the carpenter has to, to, to use? So you definitely have to go and look for your own tools that you can be able to use for that specific trade. Then let's quickly just uh, differentiate between these three terminology. We have got the tools, and the tools, they are the hand tools, or they are div divided into two groups. We have got the hand tools and the power tools. So when we talk about the hand tools, it's each and every item that you can be able to carry in your hand, and you can be able to use it. So mostly, most of those tools you can use with only one hand. But once that tool cannot be able to be used with one hand and it will need to be used with two hands, that is now going to be clustered under the equipment. So the equipment, it can either be any big tools which will need two hands or which cannot be operated by the hands which will need any other source either from electricity, from diesel, wherever that source is going to come from. And then in terms of the materials, don't confuse the tools with the materials. So for you to be able to know whether if this is a tool or this is a material, for all the tools that you're going to use, when you are using it, you must be able to take it back to your storeroom. But materials, when you are using the materials, all the material that is going to be used must remain on the place where you were working on. So you cannot be able to take the materials after you have used it, the material must remain where you were working on. Only the tools, the one that you can be able to carry into your storeroom. Then the types of the tools, as we have indicated, they are divided into two. You have got your hand tools or your manual tools, and then you have got your power tools. So the tools that we have indicated earlier on the previous slide that you can be able to carry in your hand, most of those they are going to be clustered under the hand tools. But we have got some portable tools that is belong under the power tools. Those possible, uh, portable tools can also be carried in hand, but they cannot use power from your human uh, being. It will need to be sourced either from the electricity, from the pneumatic, or it can be hydraulic, or it can be fuel, which is going to be a diesel or a petrol. Then just few of them, they will need care and maintenance. Then just to give a little bit of an example of the portable tools, the portable tools, that baby grinder that you see there, it can be a good example of a, a power tool, which is a portable tools. So somewhere, somewhere you can be able to give maybe the simple example of the uh, household uh, tools that you need or that you can be able to use uh, in the house. Then according to this 
outcome, you must be able to cluster all the tools that you know into different trades. And this, they've given you eight trades in your syllabus that you must be able to cluster in. And then the, the, the last one, which is the ninth one, is going to be the general tools. So when we talk about the general tools, the general tools is going to be each and every tool that can be used by mostly or most of the trade men. So you can be the carpenter, you must know exactly what tools do you need as a carpenter. You can be a metal work, you must know your tools as a metal work. You can be a building person, you can be a plaster, you can be a plumber, you can be a tiler, you can be a glazer, you can be a mechanic. So you must know exactly if you are one of those trades, which tool do you need in your workshop that you can be able to carry out some activity. We have got some general good housekeeping that we must follow, which if you don't stick to that somewhere, somehow you might injure yourself or have some fatal injuries in the workshop. So number one, the machine must be free from water. If it's a machine which is going to be powered from electricity, you know very well that electricity and water, they are not good friends. So you must also know that if you have got any electrical socket, make sure that it's fully sealed so that there is no end loop on the outside. Then if you are working inside the workshop, regardless of how many you are, avoid a house play, a horse play. A horse play, it means playing around the workshop without taking care of what activity is going on in the workshop. And always make sure that you are fully equipped with PPE and also avoid any open uh, circuit on the floor because otherwise you are going to get shock. Then the general tools, these are the tools which are going to be used by mostly all of those trades that we have identified. Those eight trades that we said is now grouped to be under your syllabi. And they can only be general, or they can only do the general task. It cannot be specified on any of those trades. Like for instance, if we give an example of a screwdriver. A screwdriver, most of the people will need it. A carpenter will need it. A mechanic will need it. All those kind of people, they might need it. But if you give a, a simple example of a tool, which is a, a, a tile cutter, only one person can be able to use that, which is going to be a tiler. So you will know that that type of a tool is not going to fall under the general uh, tools. Then the carpentry tools, they, they, they are the tools which is going to be used by the carpenter. And most of the time, because in this field, you are uh, measuring with carpentry and roof work, or maybe you are measuring with bricklaying, it will depend on which trades are you, but you must know exactly how many of those tools need to be within your vicinity. Then how to take care of your file. When we talk about the file, we are not going to talk about the file which is going to keep some documents in. We are talking about the file which is going to sharpen a uh, steel metal. It can either be the knife, it can either be any uh, tools that will need to be sharpened. If there is any need, you will definitely have to use the file. So after it, you have used it, make sure that you clean it with a file brush. You can sometimes use the steel brush or what is, what is called a, a wire brush. And then keep it away from the moist because it's going to get rust and also store it in a shadow board or any shelf in a storeroom and make sure that you don't mix it with any other tools because it's going to be damaged those teeth and then it's not going to be effective when you use it. Then the, the consequences of working with a blunt tools. Uh, a blunt tools is the tool which is not fully sharpened to carry out some task or which is not sharp enough to carry out some task. So it can be a time wasting or it can consume a lot of time because the part that you have to cut maybe in one second, <clears throat> it will need you to, to go to probably five seconds or 10 seconds. It will depend on how sharp or how blunt that tool is going to be. And if you are using that, you can injure yourself very much easily because somewhere, somehow you will definitely have to force yourself to be able to operate that kind of a tool and it can also delay the completion of the task. That means even the part of the job that needs to be done, the production is going to be very, very much low. People might be surprised, why are we saying the blunt tools is dangerous compared to the sharp tools? I know the sharp tools is very much dangerous if 
you have to use it uh, in a specific way. But for the dangerous tools is that if, for the blunt tools, when we say it is going to be dangerous, if you are going to use it, you are going to need too much force to apply to that type of uh, tool if you are going to use it on the material. And somewhere, somehow, you have to push hard. And when you push hard, you might slip and then you can fall. Or maybe you can injure yourself in your muscles because somewhere, somehow, you will need too much force to be able to, to use that. Then one of your outcome in your uh, topic number four is that you must be able to go and build up an oil stone. So an oil stone is the type of a stone which is specific to sharpen up some chisels. If you are working in the workshop, normally the carpenter has to, to use that more often to sharpen their chisels. Then I'll just show you some of the pictures, then you can be able to identify some of the tools or some of the equipment that we might use in the workshop. Then the first one is going to be your chalk lane. Your chalk lane is normally used to strike in the line on the material. If you have to cut the material, then you can use it. If you don't want to draw a line using the pencil and a ruler, you can use the chalk lane and then you strike uh, the line. So just take note, the chalk lane doesn't draw a line, it strikes the line into the material. And you can see that person there is using the chalk plane just to mark off that line on the materials, uh, which is referred to as striking of the line. Then you have got your combination square. Your combination square, it has got different purposes. You can either use it to measure this or to throw the straight line. You can measure it at an angle of 90 degrees. It will depend on which fitments did you put into your ruler. You can measure all different types of angle. If you have got that compass in and you have got your center finder, which is going to be able to use to find the center of a round object, which is very much difficult for most of people to identify the center of a round object. Then you have got your, your steel brush, which we said you must be able to use this one to clean up your file after you have used it, before you store it, so that it can always be clean. You can also use it for some other specific reason. Okay, then we have got a, a hole saw. A hole saw is just used to, to drill a hole in the materials. Like for instance, if you want to put the, the, the split ring, you can use the hole saw. They also come in a different sizes. so. Hence, they come in different sizes. You can be able to determine which diameter do you need. Then you have got your mitre box. Your mitre box is used to cut material at an angle. Different angle is provided for you. You have got a straight line, which is 90 degrees angle. You have got the 45 degrees angle. You have got the 60 degrees angle. Those angles, if you don't want to measure it using any measuring instrument, you can just use your mitre box to cut. There you can be able to see how it is used and when you cut it just uh, avoid cutting it through to the bottom of it because otherwise you are going to cut the materials from that matter box. So only cut the piece that you need to cut and not the box. Then you have got your, your, your T-beveled square which is going to be used to measure an angle on a roof trusses, but you can use it in different ways. So it doesn't have any specific angle. If you want to determine an angle which is given to you, you must be able to use a protector. When you have got the protector, then you can be able to measure any angle, lock it, and then you can be able to transfer it into different materials that you want. For example, if you want to throw it on the, or mark it on a timber, then you can take that measurement and go and mark it on that piece of material. Then you've got your, your countersink. A countersink is the material which is, uh, is the tool which is used just to make sure that when you are putting a screw into a material, say for instance it's a timber and you wanted to put a screw, for the screw not to stick off into the surface, you must use the countersink and then when you use the countersink, the nail or the, the screw is going to sit nicely and flat into the surface. Then you can be able to see if you don't have the countersink, your, nail, your screw is going to stick out, but if you countersink that, then your screw is going to be able to get down and then it's going to be very flat into your surface. Okay, then we have got the, 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 the vise or the bench vise, 
which is normally used to hold the material for you if you are working with the material. If you need some extra hand and you don't have extra hands, then you can be able to use that. It's your best friend if you are working in the workshop. Then you can extend it to any size that is prescribed, as long as if you know the material that you are going to work on, it can be able to fit in. Then you've got your marking cage. Your marking cage is just to mark on the piece of a timber so that you can be able to see the line. If you don't want to draw a line using the pencil, then you can use the line by means of marking with the marking cage. And when you mark with the marking cage, the good thing about it is that it runs along parallel to the edges of the timber. <clears throat> As you can see that person uh, showing you how to use that. Then you've got a planer. A planer just to thickness the, pile, the piece of material, which is going to be a wood. If you have to remove a little bit of material from the, the, the thickness, then you can use the planer. Then you've got a, a, a paintbrush, which is normally used just to apply the paint, the varnish, or whatever types of paint that you want to apply into your material. Then you've got your, your pop rivet gun. And in your pop rivet gun, it's normally used to apply or to join two pieces of metal together so that if you don't want to use the nail or the nail is not going to be effective on that two materials, then it's more uh, essential <coughs> for you to be able to use the, the pop rivet gun. Then you have got your, your screwdrivers. They come in different form. You have got your flat screwdriver, you have got your Phillips screwdriver, which sometimes is called the star screwdriver. So it depends which type of screw do you have, then you can be able to select what type of a screwdriver do you need. Say for extent you have got a screwdriver that looks like that, then you must be able to know which type of screws uh, or a screwdriver would you need. There you can also see another example, and it follow under the general tools, as we have indicated earlier, because most of the people, they can be able to use that, because screws, they are normally used in different categories. And avoid using different, <coughs> uh, different screwdrivers. If you are having a flat screw, always go and fetch the flat screwdriver. Don't use the wrong screwdriver. Then you've got your spanner, which is used to tighten or loosen up the nuts. It can depend on which size of the nut it is going to be. If it's M20, then you will know which size of the screw or of a spanner you will need. Then you've got a vice grip, a vice grip just to hold some nuts somewhere, somehow, if you want to grab some of the things which is, doesn't have any shape for you to be able to use a spanner or to use a screwdriver, then you can use the vice grip because it can take most of the shapes regardless of what material it is that you are going to use it for. Then you've got a, a pliers. We have got some set of pliers. Some of them, they can be used to cut the, the wires. Some of them just to fasten. Some of them, they can be able to be used to remove uh, some of the materials. Then you've got your, your set squares which is normally used to cut up the angles or to measure the angles. It will depend on which one is it that you are going to use. You have got your 45 set square, you have got your 60 set square, which 60 comes also along with the 30 degrees angle. So it's either 60 and 30 degrees that can be able to be used within that set square. So you can use it in different ways, either to mark it, to draw, or to transfer the measurement, which is according to those angles that we have mentioned earlier on, which is 45, 60 degrees, and 30 degrees. Then you've got your tie square, which is normally used to test if the material that you have cut it through, it is going to be at a square uh, according to the blade that we used to cut the material, or if it is a little bit skew, then you can check and test uh, using that tri square. Then you can be able to see how it is used to check if the material is square enough to, to be able to be used. If you went to maybe put the butt joints, then you can be able to test with that. You can also use that <coughs> to, to, uh, to draw the vertical lines or the horizontal lines, it will depend on the material that you are going to work on. Then you've got your jig lamp. Your jig lamp normally takes the shape of a G. So for you, it's going to be very much easy to master that because it doesn't need any extra uh, 
uh, memory just to memorize that. You just look at the shape, the shape's indicated as G, and then that is referred to as the G clamp. Then you have got the long clamp. The G clamp and the long clamp, all of those, they are normally used just to clamp the material if you are going to glue them together or just to hold two pieces together so that you can be able to work nicely on the pieces. Like for example, if you want to glue those materials or those boards together, you will apply the glue, then you take your long uh, clamp and then you clamp them together. Then you've got your, <coughs> your crowbar. Your crowbar is used normally to uplift a heavy loads or just to remove the nails from the material. Then you've got your shovel uh, or your spade, which is going to be used by the builders mostly just to mix the concrete, mixing the mortar or digging of the foundation. If you have got a smaller foundation which is falling under the shallow foundation, then you can be able to use those too. With the help of a pick that can also be used to, to dig on the hard surface. Then you've got your cooking gun. And in terms of the cooking gun, if you want to apply a silicon, then you go and fit in the silicon there. And then as you squeeze in into that silicon, then the, the, the silicone is going to come out and then you can be able to seal on all the materials that you wanted to seal off. Then you can be able to see these um, men fitting in or closing up the caps using the silicone after it has been fitted into a cooking gun. Then you have got your utility knife. Uh, sometimes you can call it a carpet knife. It's not going to be a problem. So this carpet knife is normally used just to cut surfaces or sharpen up uh, so some pencils in a uh, carpentry workshop. If you will need to use it for that, you can also use it for that. Then you've got your drill bits, which also comes in a different forms. You can decide whether if you want to cut a steel, if you want to cut your wood, if you want to drill on the walls. So they come in different uh, sizes also and different materials that they have to go and cut. Then you have got your plumb bobs. In terms of the plumb bobs, <clears throat> it's just to transfer the vertical lines from top going to the bottom without moving into sideways. So if you want to do that, you must be able to use the plumb bobs. Then you have got your wheelbarrows, which is going to be used to carry either the, the building materials to the site or from the site, or maybe if you want to mix the concrete, then you can be able to load the concrete and upload to the closest area where the builder is going to, to need that. Then lastly off, you are going to have your, your saw. You have got two sets of saw. The other one is a cross-cut saw, which means it's going to be able to cut only across the grain. And then you have got a rib saw, which is going to cut the material only on the long side of the area. Just to indicate that, you, you will notice that the, the other side is on the rib cut. That means you can only cut along the grain and not across the grain. And then on the cross cut saw, then you can be able to cut only across the grain and not along the grain. Just to wrap it off, you now know now <clears throat> what is the different types of the tools that you can be able to use for a specific reason in your workshop and take note the tools or the machine that you are going to use in the workshop, it doesn't know whether if it's cutting the material or if it's cutting your hand. So if you put your hand in front of the machine, the machine doesn't know it's going to cut it. So play safe and work uh, responsibly. So if for any social uh, media platform, if you need to interact with us, so just to make sure that you contact us on the number below the screen so that we can be able to help you for any information that you will need furthermore. Then if everybody can do it, you can also do it. Thank you.